this environment that is inconducive to the development of enterprises and entrepreneurship. Where corruption, lack of transparency, and trade barriers distort our markets, hinder competition, and lower efficiency. While we are still living this reality somewhat, over the past year, we have finally stopped accepting it. The revolution has revived our hope in a more beautiful reality, where enough jobs are created for the 2.8 million people entering the workforce every year in the Arab world. The revolution and evolution taking place across the Middle East and North Africa is altering the business climate. With higher risk comes higher reward. This is one of the first lessons we are taught here at the Harvard Business School. But how much risk is too much risk? The winds of change may be blowing too strongly for some companies, making it more challenging for them to operate in such turbulent times. For others, these same winds are unraveling a plethora of opportunities. Today's conference will not only present the prospects of doing business in the region post the revolutions, it will do so by engaging the region's top executives and worldwide executives as well. Who can better talk to doing business in the region than Mr. Arif Nakvi, CEO of Abraj Capital, one of the region's leading private equity firms? And what better way to end a content-packed day than by hearing the aspirational story of Mr. Carlos Ghassan, Chairman and CEO of Renault Nissan, as he bridges his Middle Eastern roots with global leadership. And in between these two keynote addresses, we will discuss the most recent business topics across six different panels. Finance, energy, media, women, management, and entrepreneurship. Expect debate, controversy, and many diverging opinions. What should financial institutions do to fuel corporate growth? How will the process of political change affect the world's energy markets? Can online media be used not only to ignite reform, but also to promote transparency and accountability? How can Arab women break the cement ceiling? How are the region's executives managing their organizations amidst the turbulence? What will it take to finally see a burgeoning wave of entrepreneurs launch creative and innovative ventures? These are only but a few of the questions that panelists will attempt to debate with you today. None of this would have happened without your presence with us today and without the tremendous effort of our HBS team who have dedicated their time and creativity into putting together this great conference. We are exhilarated by what this day has shaped to be and we are looking forward to having you enjoy it as much as we have enjoyed preparing it. As you go through the day, take the time to network, voice your opinions, and aim to leave with a determination to make a change, be it in your organization, community, or school. It is up to us, future and current business leaders, to draft what's next. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Shaham al -Wir. I'm the president of the Harvard Arab Alumni Association. I have the uh, privilege and honor to introduce our distinguished keynote speaker this morning, uh, Mr. Arif Naqvi. Uh, Mr. Naqvi is the founder and CEO of uh, Abraj Capital, and uh, for someone who's in that industry, I have to tell you that Abraj has completely revolutionized pr private equity in the region. Uh, they've introduced uh, global standards into private equity that's made uh, work for some of us uh, a bit harder. No longer do we see purchase agreements that are five pages long. No longer are models three pages long. Um, it's, it's, it's tough. It's now you're seeing 120 page purchase agreements and 100 page models and uh, when you go and deal with, uh, talk to their people, it's uh, the, the smartest and the best uh, human capital, um, even graduates from some of those schools across the river. So it's, uh, they've really revolutionized the industry even further than that. 
they've actually established the industry. Um, it's really, it's really ha heartfelt when you work in private equity in the region to say who has set up the standard, who's the gold standard. I think in many ways Abraj has set that standard. Um, more importantly, they've actually also expanded, not simply from doing private equity, but they've expanded into doing venture capital, looking into SMEs, looking even into smaller investments across the region, and have filed a very interesting model of expanding from the Gulf into what they always call Manasseh, and farther up into the Levant, and now even into North Africa. It's a very interesting model. Uh, I was chatting with uh, one of my colleagues yesterday and said, you know, you should think about private equity. And he said, dude, it's, I think the industry is dead. Um, I think we'll, uh, if you look at what Abraj has been doing over the last two, two years, you'll realize that the industry is anything but dead. It's alive and kicking, and uh, it's probably the future. Um, on a personal note, I think Abraj's values are very much aligned with those of the student groups here at Harvard and the, those of the Harvard Arab Alumni Association. Uh, they've done very well, obviously, for themselves on a business level, but they've given back a lot to the community, and we're very thankful for that. Uh, they're strong supporters of our association, uh, and they've done so for many years. They're strong corporate citizens in the Arab world, whether it's in the arts or supporting entrepreneurs, which is really heartfelt. Um, we thank them for that effort. Um, sometimes you think it's uh, easy to support when you were so successful, but very few people do that. So uh, that's really great. Uh, without further ado, Mr. Arif Naqvi. Thank you. Good morning, assalamu alaikum, and uh, I'd like to start by saying that people that attend Sunday morning conferences are either desperately short of information or desperately short of sleep. <laughs> but thank you on both counts for, for being here. I was asked to speak about doing business in the Middle East uh, in MENA post the revolution. And that, you know, I'd like to start off by remembering something that uh, Yogi Berra said, which, he's, which was the future ain't what it used to be. And equally, I'd like to add to that, that I'm very fond of saying that we do not inherit the future from our parents. We merely borrow it from our children. And why do I say that? It's because the future is all about risk and uncertainty. When we do boring financial models, when we analyze risk, when we look at the value inherent in investing into the future, we're always consumed by this risk and this uncertainty that we're going to face. Well, the interesting thing is the future is very much here. And we are living through a serious watershed moment in the world's history, not just in the MENA region's history. And I also think that we should recognize that we're privileged to be living through it. It's not an accidental moment. There is so much happening around the world, and there's seismic shifts that we're seeing um, as we're going through it. And what I'd like to do is, before talking about doing business in MENA post-revolution, and I'd like to come back to the use of those words post-revolution, I'd like to just quickly take a journey around the world and talk about what we're seeing. Let's go back to the definition of risk. Where did it come from? What does it mean? We still, in evaluating business opportunity, consider risk, and we attach a risk premium when we look at emerging markets. I'm not going to go into any discussion around whether we should also be today attaching risk premium attributable to systematic risk and structural problems in OECD countries. I'll merely start by saying that when risk came in 2008, it came from the heart of capitalism. It came from New York City and from the investment banking community. However, I don't think that when we looked at how to address that risk, we in the global financial services community did not adequately stop and rectify the reasons why that risk took place. We just kicked the problem down the road. And of course it was going to come back and haunt us. We didn't do enough on the regulation. We didn't do enough on the governance. We didn't do enough in terms of punishing people that had transgressed risk. And as a result, when it came back and hit us in the form of the Eurozone crisis and the sovereign crisis, a lot of people appeared to be surprised, but there was no surprise. It was an inevitable consequence of some fairly loose behavior that had occurred in the 10 years earlier. So before we talk about our region, we have to understand that in this increasingly interconnected, globalized, and very, very complicated world, 
We cannot ignore what is happening in the US. We cannot ignore what is happening in the Europe. And what we have to now work out as we look forward is are we truly entering what Christine Lagarde called the lost decade, or are we going to recover? Are the long-term fundamentals the same, or have the long-term fundamentals just led to a perception alteration? That is what we should be thinking about. I feel that all around what we have, and not just in the Middle East region, we have a crisis of leadership. And that leadership is sadly lacking wherever we go. And without leadership, we all know that not the world, not a country, not a business is capable of pulling itself out of the dilemma it finds itself in. Of course, today everybody is obsessed about emerging markets, and our markets, the Middle East and North Africa, are a subset of that. And when we look at the emerging markets, we understand that it contributes one third of global output, and yet it is acknowledged to be responsible for two thirds of expected global growth. Both McKinsey and Bain have estimated that there's something like 423 cities that are going to be contributing close to 45% of global GDP by the year 2030. And of these 423 cities, every single one is in emerging markets, and most of them are names that you haven't yet heard of. And that is where the growth potential and prospects are. The middle classes in emerging markets are expected to reach 1.2 billion people, up from about 400 million people today. And that again is the growth impetus of the future, because 1.2 billion people is more than the entire uh, population of the OECD countries. So having gone around the world, focused on the growth opportunities in emerging markets, I'd like to return to the topic and your use of the word revolution. Was it one, I ask you? Or was it the fact that if CNN and Jazeera had not referred to it as a revolution in Egypt, would we have called it a rebellion? Would we have called it a revolt? Would we have then reacted sympathetically in a different manner? There are no real cherry, cherry blossoms in the Arab Spring. We cannot generalize this Arab Spring into one big movement, but let's try. When Muhammad Bouazizi burnt himself, he did not do so because he was politically frustrated. He did not do so because he wanted a change in the Tunisian government. He did so because he was economically deprived. And that is at the heart of everything that we have seen happening in this Arab region. We've now created as a result of what he started, what I call a reasonably young and a reasonably fearless, relatively fearless group of people that are willing to push the boundaries. And these people, these young people, we have to remember 25% of these people, some of them very educated, are utterly unemployed. The cost of this unemployment to the region annually is about $50 billion. We're also seeing slowly in some cases and quickly in others the end of Republican dynasties. We're seeing an emerging role of the army, and hence my question, was it a revolution or was it a coup from day one? Is it a sym symptomatic rectification of the army in Egypt, the army in Yemen, the army in Syria, looking to see whether it needs to dump part of the establishment in order to continue to evolve the status quo as they used to have it? So that role has yet to be properly identified and worked its way through. Uh, there is the role of the Islamists, which causes great fear in the West, but when they look at Turkey, they say, aha, we need to have the Turkish model. But the Turkish model itself is also fraught with some difficulty, and I don't think you can replicate what happens in one country into another. And we have a growing problem of sectarianism, which we cannot ignore. Monarchies, interestingly, have struck back. They call themselves, they refer to it as the return of liberal thinking and excessive spending back into their economies. But in actual fact, what they're doing is they're further cementing a already concrete hold on power. And what we see is that the challenges that we are now facing in the MENA region are absolutely no different from the challenges that we face in other growth markets around the world. So if we were to chart MENA, today on analysis wise with BRIC countries on metrics ranging from unemployment to perceived corruption to food inflation to governance uh, 
You get a very mixed bag of results. In some cases, MENA countries score higher than BRIC countries. In some cases, worse. MENA as a region has its own very idiosyncratic challenges and these opportunities, but you cannot reduce those challenges into an Arab Spring equation. Nor can you reduce it to a requirement for wholesale change. Each country will progress in its own speed with its own given set of parameters. And regime change, ladies and gentlemen, may not lead to political change. That's a very, very important question and an answer that I feel we're going to see over the course of the next couple of years. The issues that are facing this region are not new. They've been there for a while, and I don't understand why they're a surprise to so many people. Because I saw a few people in this audience that I have been talking to and meeting and debating this issue with for the last 10 years, which is when the Arab Human Development Report came out in 2002. Uh, it highlighted unemployment, it highlighted lack of participatory governance, and it hi highlighted lack of incentives for the private sector as the key themes. Job creation became a major mantra and everybody started repeating it. And it was quite interesting because everybody had the statistic, 100 million jobs just to keep the rate of unemployment constant. Bang, we need to do this, bang, we need to do that. But who did anything? I posture, hardly anyone. Because it was there, it was a time bomb waiting to happen, and nobody did anything about it. In 2006, I remember that Abraj produced an information memorandum around a new fund that we were doing at that time, in which we highlighted these very same issues backed up by a lot of empirical research. We went ahead and invested in sectors that we felt addressed that, in very strong defensive sectors at that time, counter-cyclical, and alhamdulillah, we did very well. But not a lot of people did. And so the question I need to ask myself is, with all of that backdrop, where are we? So when you talk about business opportunity, let's first take stock of where we are. And I started off by saying that the uncertainty in our region has not gone up. In my opinion, it has come down. And why? Because the future, as we knew it, is here. One year ago, not that long ago, less than a year ago, had we been sitting in the same conference, the questions we would have been asking ourselves is what happens when Husni Mubarak leaves? What happens when Yemen has a transition change? What happens when X? What happens with Y? Well, the reality is all of that has happened. The future has been accelerated. The uncertainty has been taken out of the future and been put into the present. And depending on how it's dealt with over the course of the next 12 months to 18 months, I believe believe that the rest of that future is going to be remarkably bright because what we have now which cannot be taken away and that is why I am afraid I have to talk a bit of politics because it is completely inextricably linked with business. The fact that we have asserted a right to a better life is now without question part of the folklore. It exists. The fact that we are seeking greater involvement in some form of the other in governance and in terms of economic independence is also there, it cannot be ignored. Governments now have to focus on people and on their requirements in the short term and the long term. Doesn't matter if you're in Egypt or in Saudi Arabia, this has to happen. My only hope is that they understand that my definition of long term is 10 years, not the Keynesian definition of long term, where we're all dead. So hopefully we'll see some transition, some change in the relatively recent uh, in coming future. Now, we have some incredibly strong fundamentals in MENA. And let's focus on those before we talk about what we can do in business. The first fundamental, which we have often sought in the last 10 to 15 years to downplay, because in some way we felt ashamed of it, and yet it was the source of all our revenue because we wanted to show ourselves as dynamic and growing and, and part of the world economy. And what I mean by that is the hydrocarbon liquidity that exists in the region. The MENA region accounts for 44% of the world's total oil reserves. We produce annually 27% of global production. Now, it doesn't matter if you think that oil is going to run out in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, or 100 years. The reality is that our share as a result of that equation that I just pointed out to you, our share of global production is going to keep going higher and higher. And as that resource dwindles and its scarcity increases, its cost revenue base is going to increase. And as a result, the re countries of the region are going to be awash in liquidity. How will they use it? The second statistic or big 
uh, reality measure to keep in mind is our demography. 50% of our people are less than 25 years old today. Our population growth is twice that of the global average. Who are these people? They're aspirational, they're underprivileged. And at the same time, they have seen MTV, they have seen what's out there in the world, and they have a pent-up consumer demand that needs to be satisfied. They don't have education, they have a lack of it. They don't have high quality education, but they're seeking it. The third major force that I see as a force for positive change in business is the regional integration story. Again, a story that people like us and many other business houses in the region saw very early on. Um, and I saw Samir Hanna here, Bank Audi saw it probably earlier than anybody else, which is that the region is much bigger than the individual country capacity. And what that means is businesses that grow across that region and as a regional company supplant the multinational company in terms of product delivery capacity and quality, those businesses will do well and have done well. And really, this all started with the advent of satellite TV because the cost of marketing across the region went down dramatically and the outreach to the consumer went up dramatically. And that, in my opinion, is a big growth story for tomorrow as well. We continue to have a pent-up demand structure across many industries due to historic underinvestment. And that includes healthcare, that includes education, power, logistics, banking, manufacturing, all forms of infrastructure that have yet to be done. And finally, a big industry which is still very, very ignored in the region, which is the industry of remittances how people that come into the region spend their money and where they send it to. So resource-rich countries generate income for these people that go into human capital-rich countries and provide development opportunities there. Now, as a result of everything that's happened, I'm a firm believer that good or bad, autocratic or democratic, countries are going to start to have to focus on governance. In the age of Twitter, in the age of Facebook, in the age of instant TV, you cannot anymore run your country the way it used to be run. I suppose Muammar Gaddafi's last words should have been, so who is this book face? Uh, and I'm pretty sure he died saying that too. But it got him and it got a lot of other leaders and it will get a few more as time goes on. But the public sector across this region is going to focus on governance. It is going to focus on some form of reform, sometimes at its own speed and sometimes based on demands placed upon it. It will focus on education. It has already started focusing on infrastructure. And most importantly, it will and must focus on the promotion of entrepreneurship. Now, we in the private sector have got a golden opportunity to be robust at this moment and work to evolve ourselves, our business practices and our communities. The role of SMEs, which is the lifeblood of economies, cannot be ignored or understated. And it's not an accident that we are now very active in the SME space. And the reason for that is there is a time and space for big, uh, large private equity transactions. It hasn't gone away. It will continue to be there. And as an aside, I'll tell you, that the quality of deal flow that I'm seeing today, I have never seen in my entire career. I'm not that old, but in my entire career, I've never seen it so good. Why? Because businesses that were affiliated with governments that are now not so popular are desperate to get out. But some of those businessmen have built glorious industries and are willing to sell for cents on the dollar, but the transaction sizes are so large that very few players can consummate them. But those opportunities are once-in-a-lifetime opportunities. And we thank God that we have the scale to be able to consummate some of them, but that on the PE side is an enormous opportunity. But that creates wealth. It does not create employment. It does not create harmonious societies. Investors will get wealthy on the PE side. People will get wealthy on the SME side. And what I mean by that is if you stop and think, in the United States between, I think it was, <coughs> excuse me, between 1980 and 2005, you had close to 40 million new jobs that were created in the US by companies that were less than five years old 
at the time the statistic was taken. This came from the SME sector. The SME sector in the West is practically speaking 50% of GDP output, 50% of employment. In our region, without active, uh, accurate statistics being available, I postulate it's closer to 80% of employment, 25 to 30% of GDP. The ability to match that and grow that and bring that to more parity is enormous. And the reason for that, again, is because it is statistically proven that investment and growth in SMEs is twice that of, um, in terms of creating employment and profits, is twice that compared to large corporates. And that is a statistic that has come out of the EU. What else do SMEs create? Innovation, hence diversification from traditional sources of growth. They create disruptive business models. And most important of all, they create an opportunity for employment growth amongst communities that would not otherwise see it. Now, one SME initiative that I've been fortunate to be a part of, which is the Riyadh uh, Enterprise Development, which is a $500 million initiative that we created. Interestingly, our largest support came from the DFI community, the, D the international DFI community, the European DFI community. Local investors still didn't pick it up as actively, not realizing the overall equation that actually investment into these smaller businesses leads to higher percentage equity growth and, and profitability as well. In this period, the reason I'm giving this example, I hate talking always about, I always hate talking about our business, but um, I feel that it's important to work this one through, that in the last six months, the robustness of the SME pipeline is such that we've looked at 400 separate transactions over this period. We've done 20 of those transactions, and we've had a 43% growth in top line in this year in those industries in which we invested. And where were these industries? They were in Egypt, they were in Jordan, they were in Palestine, they were in Lebanon, they were in the UAE, they were in Tunisia. And we found ourselves being able to invest close to $100 million into these industries. I'll give you one example. We invested in a guy called Imad Musebe. He is a grower of herbs and vegetables in Palestine. And we unleashed his ability to innovate and to be an entrepreneur. Today, he's doubled his productive capacity, less than six months in. He's selling to the United States of America. He's taken 60 workers up to 250 workers. He's going to go from 15 women in employment to 50 women in employment in rural Palestine. He set up a packaging base that carries a proud label that says made in Palestine. This is a small step to economic sovereignty as well. And it's these sort of people that are out there that are really in the vanguard of creating employment. A small business, a small example. But when you look at the multiplicative effect of something like that, you'll see that you find them in the unlikeliest of places and as the savviest of businessmen. I'd like to sort of bring this to a conclusion by then talking about, yes, there is the opportunity, yes, it exists, and yes, you can see a way through and formulate a business plan and a strategy as well. But we're lacking. We're lacking in so many different areas as well. Some we can address. We must step into the breach that an ineffective and a casual public sector brings about. We as the private sector have got to step forward. And there are constraints that we cannot step forward into. I'll start by saying the first, which is crucial, is access to finance. IFC and McKinsey estimate that unfunded capital requirements in the MENA region today are 140 billion US dollars for businesses that are up and running and need capital. We still haven't clarified in terms of access to finance what the role of our sovereign wealth funds are across the region. Unfortunately, in the excitement and euphoria of the early part of the century, sovereign wealth funds started thinking of themselves as private equity funds. They forgot that their real role is to safeguard wealth for future generations. So we started buying buildings in New York City and competing on transactions with the Carlisles and Blackstones of the world globally. That's not the role of sovereign wealth funds. Sovereign wealth funds should be generating returns that beat the normative average and get to a point 
where they can provide money for future generations upkeep and good. The classic role for that was to step into the breach that was caused in 2008 and 9 by project finance in the region drying up, by the Japanese and Australian banks no longer being able to give the 20 year and 30 year credit, and by actually stepping into that breach and helping infrastructure grow. It wasn't done, it's still not being done. And their ability to invest closer to home is something that needs to be both sanctified and quantified and brought forward in terms of what they can do. The second constraint that we have is access to talent. A lot of people that go back and work in the region prefer the public sector, they prefer the multinational sector, or they prefer the financial sector. And the second com complement to that point of access to talent is that we also have a brain drain. So many people educated come back, get frustrated and leave. And that is something that we need to prevent. A third element in access to talent is the lack of vocational training. It's all very well for everyone to go to university, but if we're going to invest in infrastructure, we also need welders, we also need mechanics, and we're not doing enough to train people in those vocational trades that can then be brought to bear, and people from the region can work in the region. It is not necessary, and I know it sounds horrible, but we import so many workers in this region from outside the region when we have the capacity in human resource rich countries to tool those people, provide them vocational training, and put them to use in productive employment. And I feel we owe it to our region to do that as well. Finally, when we look at constraints, I see a lack of stakeholder involvement. It's a lack of a stakeholder approach. Remember, who started the boom in China and who started the boom in India? It was not the Carlyles and the PE firms of the world that went in and found that opportunity. It was expat Chinese businessmen. It was expat Indian businessmen that found the fact that the risk-reward ratio in their own country was adequate for them to start taking risks and bringing money and capital back. They came back, they spurred growth, and they led to the first signs of change in those economies. Their rewards were higher, but so was their involvement. And we have to remember that when we take an example like Dr. Reddy, who set up Apollo hospitals, 1983 to today, 60,000 people, 6,500 hospital beds, one of the most advanced hospital companies in the world, and it came out of people, somebody that's, that was an expat, I can give you a thousand such examples of commitment back into your own country and your own territory. And then the final constraint that I'd like to highlight, which a lot of people ignore, is the role of women. Women in our part of the world are an enormously disenfranchised community and they continue, if you take the estimate of some banks as to the wealth control by women in our region, there is $700 billion of wealth that is waiting to be unleashed by women if they were properly utilized and allowed to uh, expand into business activity as well. The region needs this infectious enthusiasm of people coming back. The region needs the talent, the learnings, the skill sets, the entrepreneurship that is classically driven by youth. And by that I mean the people in this audience. You are going to make the difference, not people like me. You have to understand the trade-off between risk and reward. I feel I do. I understand this region and I'd like to share some of that infectious enthusiasm with you. Growth markets are the future. There is no two ways around it. I'd like to ask you a question. Would you rather invest in a low growth, high leverage environment or would you rather invest in a growth market, limited leverage overhang, fundamental business growth being spurred and operational enhancements still in front of you? I think the answer is pretty obvious as to where I would and I hope you would. In growth markets, should we go to where you are one of 20 different people putting term sheets down or competing to set up and get an industrial license? Or do you go where too much money is chasing too few deals? Or do you go where you are appreciated, accepted, welcomed, where you have the opportunity to create partnerships, where you work with a partner to unleash value through operational enhancement, through growth across boundaries, that is what the MENA region 
till today continues to represent. There's no two ways around it. I'll give you two examples. In Turkey, we invested in a hospital business three and a half years ago. We've just, called Achibadan, we've just merged it with uh, the Malaysian Sovereign Wealth Fund uh, Khazana owned business called Parkway in Singapore. And together, these two businesses coming together is going to create one of the largest hospital management businesses in the world coming out of emerging markets. And the growth fundamentals for that are enormous. Similarly, working with a partner, we invested in an education company that was owned 100% by one family. We took a small stick, 25%. Our objective was not to dominate that company. But what we did with that partner is he said, this is a family business. I want you to bring in governance. I want you to bring in transparency. I want you to bring in reporting. And most of all, I want you to bring in talent that would not work in a family business. We did that over a four year period. We took it from being 12 schools to 70 schools, 12,000 kids to 100,000 kids. And today we're selling our stake back to the family. Why? Because it's their business, which they will then take public. We've made a great return, but that's the essence of partnership. The investing view that you take has got to be fundamental. It cannot be governed by bias or short-term hiccups. What we are going through today from a business perspective in the region is a short-term hiccup. Our region is too central in this world to ignore. I'd like to point out to you that Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, Turkey, China, all of them achieved fundamental change in their governance models and their capacity to attract investment and talent in less than a generation. And I fail to see why we can't do the same. And if it is to be done, it is going to be your generation, actually, that does that. And finally, how many times have you been told that you are the future? I'm not talking about those who are my age group, I'm talking to the younger people. We are not. Well, let me tell you, it's a lie. You are not the future, you are the present. And Yogi Berra, who I talked about at the start, was wrong too. The future is infinitely brighter when I look at people like you, and infinitely brighter than when I was sitting in the same seats as you. So God bless your endeavors. Thank you so much for having me talk today. And I appreciate it. We are going to open it up for questions. Um, we have two microphones here. Um, please limit your questions to under 30 seconds and make sure they end with a question mark. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you for organizing everything. Um, my question is, if you took control of economic policies in Egypt, what would be the first thing that you would try to implement? Thanks. I think um, Egypt today is at a crossroads facing so many fundamental challenges that I will go on record as saying that I felt what we had in the previous government was a situation where there was some form of economic reform and liberalization taking place, completely unbacked by political reform, unbacked by fundamental rights, and therefore the system got so skewered that it became very difficult post uh, the change in government to decipher what was really needed. The first collective process that resulted, therefore, was this obsession towards subsidies. I think in Egypt, if we go back to not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, looking at some of the changes that the previous government had brought in, continue to implement them, focus on employment opportunity, and continue to evolve and develop the sectors that need to be developed that will enable Egypt to realize the reform process that had already started. I think that's what we need to be looking at. There's no one sector. You can't say invest in logistics. You can't say go back to investing in agriculture. You can't say please cut down subsidies here but increase them there. It is an entire holistic process that needs to be looked at by a government that understands economics rather than a government that is governed just by stability and let's just keep everything constant while we work out what's happening. Whilst they're working out what's happening, a lot of people are suffering. Um, again, thank you so much for coming. Um, I guess you posed two different situations. You talked about the economic downturn, and you asked us if you thought that the um, long-term models would still stand. And at this, yeah. Can you, can you 
speak up, please? And yeah. keep a distance between your mouth and you. Okay. Um, you talked about the economic downturn, and you asked whether or not the long-term models would still stand. Can you hear me? Yeah, if you could just be a little bit further back okay. from the mic. <laughs> okay. Is this better? Much better. Okay, thank you. So, you asked whether or not the long-term models would still stand after the economic downturn, and you also talked about how there's in, like, decreased risk in the MENA region because the present is now. So I guess I want to ask those questions back to you. Do you think the long-term models still stand, and how will your investment strategy change with this like decreased risk in the present? Sure. Um, I think, look, the long-term model is very sustainable, okay? But no long-term model is sustainable without the concomitant sort of economic and political reform taking place at the same time. I, again, just to be a little bit provocative, I'll tell you that some of the reform processes that happen in Saudi Arabia, which is not well known for its liberalism, let's say, but some of the reform processes that happen in Saudi Arabia over the course of the last five to seven years on the economic front are some of the boldest initiatives taken anywhere in the world. Saudi Arabia on a competitiveness basis went from you know, being 80 or 90 to being almost in the top 10. The Capital Reforms uh, Act in Saudi Arabia is one of the most progressive in the world today. However, you still won't see as much FDI opportunity coming into Saudi Arabia because large parts of the world perceive it to not have the economic, the, the political model that enables that investment to be safe. I personally feel very comfortable investing in Saudi Arabia. I think it's a great economy to invest in and the opportunities are tremendous because both the government and the private sector are actually totally aligned to making investments happen in that country. But that is just one example of where the political reform process which is lagging needs to catch up with the economic reform process. In other countries, it's the opposite way around. Okay? So taken as a region, if you remember, I said let's not take the region as one holistic entity, let's deal with each country independently. But on a long-term basis, the sustainable value creation caused by demographics, caused by hydrocarbon liquidity, caused by pent-up demand, caused by opportunity subsets for women, and so on and so on, means that across industry, this is just a growth opportunity. The only thing that's going to hold us back is availability of talent, availability of finance, and most important of all, a willingness of governments to let go. They do not need to control every aspect of business activity. SMEs, entrepreneurship, will spur economic activity. They will enable a lot of creativity to happen in the system. But governments, for example, in the UAE, we still have a fairly restrictive companies law. We need to break out of that. But that has been on the anvil now for two or three years. They just need to press the trigger and say, let's go. And then you will see a much greater impetus into sectors of the economy that are being ignored. And why are they being ignored? Because large corporates, government institutions, have at this moment in time, and real estate, has sapped up the capital capacity of banks to be able to invest into those other sectors. And there isn't sufficient central bank funding coming in to offset that. Uh, Robin Lahoud, HBS class of 2011. Thank you, Mr. Nagvi. My question for you is, you mentioned that uh, there needs to be a development in vocational institutes in the region. Um, I think this is largely a cultural issue, and my question is, how do you propose we overcome this taboo and have local people be involved in low-skilled jobs? Let me give you a very simple example. Um, let's take Egypt as an example, which is an exporter of manpower. And let's take Jordan as an example of a country which is an exporter of manpower. And let's take the UAE and Saudi Arabia as importers of manpower. I think the smartest thing that the government of the UAE or Saudi Arabia could do, or the sovereign wealth funds in those countries could do, or even business houses in those countries could do, would be to set up large-scale vocational universities in Egypt, in Sudan, in Jordan, and in countries in the region that are manpower exporters. They train the talent locally into everything from being um, welders to mechanics to construction workers to hospitality workers, and the list is endless. Okay? There are models in the world that exist, the Germans, the Swiss, city and guilds in the UK, all of these people that have developed the art of vocational training to par excellence. If you set up vocational universities in those locations, what's the impact? The Egyptian worker is trained at source. When he comes into Saudi Arabia, he commands a higher salary. Those that are left back are productive into their own domestic economies at a much higher 
capability level and the knock-on impact across the system is enormous. Vocational training is a very, very important component for countries that are in transitional phases. Not everybody can and should go to university. It is wrong. And those that do often come out completely unmatched to the needs of the economy. In Saudi Arabia, there was a disproportionate production of IT engineers seven or eight years ago. Everybody wanted to be an IT engineer or a computer physician, let's call it. There wasn't enough work in the system. So matching the skill set, matching the requirement, and then doing it at source is something that is going to have an explosive impact across the region. And it's good for everyone. Um, and sorry, that's what I mean when I say an inclusive stakeholder approach. Everybody must combine to work this because whose interest is it? It's in the interest of the big corporates. It's in the interest of governments to get trained people. It's in the interest of the exporting country. And it's in the interest of philanthropists. So everyone gets involved from the NGO sector to social entrepreneurs to business people to governments. It's a policy framework decision. Sorry, I got a bit excited about that. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. My name is Wallah Hashriya and um, th th recently there, there was always talk about sort of creating an independent... No, military. same story. Could you step back a little bit? Yeah. All right. And re recently there have always been talk about creating an independent military that's independent from the, re from the regimes. Now there's talk of creating an independent business class. I have two questions related. One, how likely will that happen in the Gulf region? And I specify the Gulf region where their excellencies run these polities as companies and then being their CEOs. So how likely will that happen there? And two, why is there an embedded presumption that the business class will want to see representative, uh, representative governments, uh, uh, change of, of governments, etc.? I didn't get that. What did you say? Did you say yeah, you're talking about whether the business climate in the Gulf is going to get more proactive to change, right? Is that what you said? The, the first question is, how likely will we see an independent business class in the Gulf mm. where there is, the, where, where the division between the, the, you know, the politicians and, and uh, business... So let me, let me answer that question just to start with, which is, let me assure you, that the business community in the Gulf is actually reasonably independent of the political system. You should be very clear on that and if it wasn't, companies like us and a lot of businesses that are represented in the audience wouldn't exist. Okay? Not everybody is either ruled or dominated by someone who comes from a ruling family or government. <laughs> there is enough independence and there is a lot of vibrancy. I'll point to you the case of Dubai for example. Dubai, a lot of people, and I'm sure in these same conferences over the last two or three years, <coughs> a lot of people have debated the future of Dubai. Is this a good economic model? What happened? Why did Dubai implode? Let me tell you, every sector in Dubai today is back, with the exception of real estate. Whether it's services, logistics, transport, airlines, hotels, you name it. Everything is back to normal. Let me tell you why. Not because the government did a thing. The government actually did nothing. The conducive enabling environment that had been created before continued to exist. What actually happened is close to 200 nationalities that live in that city and have created a fabric and a culture that is very intertwined actually got up and started trading with each other again. That is independence for you. And every business that operates in that city operates on that principle and that basis. The government dominated businesses are the ones you read the headlines about that have the banks all tied up in repayments and so on. The business community is thriving. And that only happens when you have a conducive economic environment that is largely free of government interference. Dubai has actually cracked that nut very well. And there's no reason why other countries will not do so as we go forward. We have time for two more questions. We have time for two more questions, please. You should have stopped me talking much earlier. I love this. <laughs> Hi, my name is Yezin al Casey. I'm from McGill University. It was an honor to hear you speak, Mr. Nakli. I have a question about the youth. We always hear from your generation about how the youth are great and you expect them to actually... Sorry, sorry, our generation. From... Yours and mine. Okay. <laughs> We're the same. I'm not older than you. <laughs> 
But there's a lot of expectation for us to change the region and to fix a lot of the problems from the generation before us. Yeah. And I strongly believe that we can do it. But the question is, will the older generation, will they help us? They always say that they want to, but when push comes to shove and we ask for help or we ask for support, it's often not very forthcoming. So I want to know from you and, and the businesses that you advise and consult, what are, what's your strategy for, first of all, giving us incentives to go back and dedicate our lives to that region? And what are you guys actively doing in terms you of don't, steps? Thank you. Yeah. But you don't owe anything to anybody except to yourself. Starting point. Mm -hmm. Number two, you are, as I said when I was speaking, you are without question the opportunity set for the future for this region. It's not the older generation. And why is that? Because the world itself is changing. We're in a watershed moment. Technology is going to change us beyond concept. Does my generation understand technology? No. Does my generation understand the need for change? No because we have benefited from the status quo. But your generation understands it is entrepreneurial. And sometimes we forget that when we live in the United States, when we live in Europe, and we see entrepreneurship being celebrated, we forget that it is just a normal part of the ecosystem. In our part of the world, it's an exception. But don't forget, every great business house in that region today, Every one of the top 500 or 1,000 institutions that exist in that region today was started by one man and by an entrepreneur with a vision and a dream. There is absolutely no reason why you can't be that entrepreneur with that vision and that dream. But don't look for incentives, don't look for help. Do it on your own and struggle. And you'll get there. Except that one thing. Is the microphone on? We are expected to undertake an extraordinary challenge of transforming a region and we cannot be expected to start from scratch. We need to be going back there and to have a foundation to build on because without even that basic foundation, it is unreasonable to expect from us to take on some extraordinary challenges. We talk about 70 million jobs created in eight years. There is no way that we can actually reasonably expect to take on that challenge, no matter how young we are, no matter how well educated we are, without a strong, broad coalition of actors working very closely with one another. So as entrepreneurial as we are, as visionary as we are, as confident as we are, we need to have an infrastructure where we could work, where everybody can work together to take these challenges on. I would really, really like to see something like that in place so that we are not kind of deprived of the hope of undertaking you know, this challenge. I, I'm yeah. going to give you an internship next summer. <laughs> <laughs> I'd appreciate that. Give us I'm, all. Give I'm us then, all an internship. No, no, but that, the point is, I'm not alone. We're not the only business. Come back and work in that region for two, three months and see the change that is happening. See the change that is happening that big business is bringing in around the opportunity set and forcing governments to recognize that it is time that the entrepreneurship segment, the SME segment grows. And even if you look at the last one year, in countries from Lebanon to Saudi Arabia to the UAE, laws have been reformed, opportunities have been made available, and you will find the world is changing. Then it's up to you. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm Elias Jiribi. I'm from Tunisia. I'm former consultant, a McKinsey consultant. Uh, I worked with the transition government in Tunisia during the last six months, and now I stepped down. I am CEO of a startup, IT startup between Tunisia and France. I have one comment and one qu a question. My comment: I really thank you for your inspiring speech. I totally agree with everything except one thing. Bazizi emulated himself not only because he was economically deprived, but also but because of sense of unfairness. Who will? go up until democracy and freedom. This is my comment. My question is, Abraj acquired um, uh, asset management team in Northern Africa, in North Africa like the uh, uh, few uh, last months. How do you see the Northern African region? I mean, especially Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. This is a French-speaking area. This is maybe different. This is six hours from the, you know, six hours plane from the Gulf region and only two hours plane from Paris. Do you see it as like an expansion of the MENA region or more uh, um, a gate to Europe and opportunity to go from Europe. I mean, what I'm seeing today in Tunis, we are too much connected with Europe and very, very low connection with the other, the Levant area and the Gulf area. So now that you asked that question, you gave me the opportunity to say that I don't believe that there's anything systematically called the MENA region. There is the Middle East, 
there is North Africa and there are other parts of the world. The commonality is language, culture and religion. Okay? It is enough to build a basis for cooperation, but by the same token that can be extended to other parts of the extended region as well. So North Africa and the French speaking countries of North Africa are very important to us, which is why we acquired uh, the Omundi platform with a fair number of people and a fair number of assets which we intend to deploy. We think the opportunity subset there is very great. We started and continued and evolved it during the problems in Tunisia and Algeria and during the maximum disruption that was being caused during the Arab Spring. So obviously we are believers. We think the fundamental opportunity is great. We think the reconstruction opportunity in all of these countries is high. But we as a business, if you think back for a second, and you allow me the two-second party political broadcast. What we do is we started, as you said earlier, with the Gulf, the Middle East, North Africa. We're extending into Africa. We're extend we've extended already into South Asia. And we're doing more and more in Southeast Asia. We're an emerging markets firm with an emerging markets DNA, which is rooted its heart in the region. We may be a bigger firm, but we are a firm with a very small cultural sense. And we believe that if you're not local, you shouldn't be present, which is why we went into those markets. And we'll never do investments in markets unless we have physical, on-ground, local talent and capacity to help us grow our own thinking in that market. Thank you very much, Mr. Nagvi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. As a token of our appreciation, we'd like to present you with this. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. You. The next panels are.